As you may or may not know, my mother, Grandmaster Pia Kremlin, is right now playing the Women's World Cup in Sochi, Russia. And I wanted to show you how the games are going and go through those games with you so that you're updated on how she's doing in the tournament. This is actually my first time making a video outside of Twitch, like actually just making a video for you guys here on YouTube and I'm super pumped about it. So let's go ahead and get this, let's go ahead and get this started. So I'm going to be showing you the first game of the match, uh, the game that she played yesterday. Not for you, but for me. <laughs> for me yesterday. First game of the match. So she plays against uh, Monica Sacco in this match, and now in, in, in this round, in round number two. And she is going to be playing her with both the black and white pieces. So she's actually finished both of those games now. And I'll make a separate video for the other game but in this one she's playing with the black pieces and because she's playing with the black pieces and she's a little bit less comfortable with um with playing with the black pieces she was very happy if she got a draw like she was aiming for a draw she was like you know i'm gonna play a solid game and i'm just gonna try to get a draw so we can see that Monika Soko, a very strong grandmaster from Poland, is playing with the white pieces. And funny story, me and Monika Soko's kids <laughs> are pretty good friends. I'm pretty good friends with her daughter uh, because uh, both Monika and her husband, they're both grandmasters. And well, I always thought as a kid having two chess grandmaster parents that I could relate to people with grandmaster parents. So me and Veronica Sacco, her daughter, used to play hide and seek during tournaments and play cards and play lots of things that were not chess. But we had lots of fun during tournaments. So it's kind of fun that my mom is playing as Monica Sacco, you know, long-term family friend. Um, and yeah, let's go ahead and see how it went. So D4 was played by Monica, very, 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 you know, normal standard first move. My choice of first move, D4, absolutely awesome. Tell me in the comments down below if you prefer D4, E4, or any other opening move. D4, D5, this is just getting into a queen's pawn opening. And now we go C4. And C4, now we have uh, the queen's gambit. So you're basically, basically, you're basically giving away this pawn, but saying, you know what, you can take this pawn, but if you take it, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be controlling the center. I'm gonna be getting lots of center. I am going to be deviating one of your central pawns into, you know, the side. Um, and also this pawn is always going to be pretty weak. The black pawn, if it takes on C4, always gonna be pretty weak. White is pretty much, in most cases, always going to be uh, get, getting back that pawn. So that would be called the queen's gambit accepted. But my mom, she went for c6, and this is just a queen's gambit decline. This is a slav defense. And a slav defense is very often used when uh, you're trying to go for a draw or when you're trying to play very solid. I mean, it doesn't always end in a draw, of course, but it is a very solid opening. So knight f3 was played by Monica, very normal, you know, developing move. Knight f6 as well, just getting those knights out. And now everybody in this position, typically, typically, white goes for their knight c3 or for e3, or you know, anything like that. But actually, Monica in this position surprised my mother by going knight bd2. And this move is not really common because typically you wanna get this bishop out in this diagonal, and when you get your knight here, you're blocking that bishop from doing that. So it's not really that common. Also, typically when you push c4, typically, you want to have a knight here on c3, putting some extra pressure towards that d5 pawn. And sometimes there is some lines with the knight on c3 where you take, take, and have a knight jumping up over here. It's just a lot more common to have the knight on c3, basically. But this is a pretty big surprise. And I guess she just wanted to play something that wasn't, you know, that common. So bishop f5 was played by my mom. Idea, just to defend, just to defend that e4 square, getting the bishop out to a very, 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 very active diagonal. This bishop is typically a bishop that uh, is bad for black. We can see that all of these pawns are in light squares, which means that, you know, if all the blocks are in light squares, it means that there's lots of pieces that are blocking that bishop. So it's, uh, it can be really good to get that bishop out quite early on so that it becomes an active bishop throughout the game. G3 was played by Monica just to get this bishop out on this diagonal, maybe putting some extra pressure over here, maybe looking towards playing e4 at some point in the game, not now. And now e6 was played, just so that you can get this bishop out. Bishop d2, 
and age six. And you may wonder, why are black, why is black, Devon doesn't know to speak English, why is black going age six? Well, you know, there's a beautiful arrow that I created before this game to show you that. <laughs> the idea of going age six is that um, you, cr you give this age seven square for your bishop. So if at any point the knight goes to h4 to try to exchange the knight for the bishop, you have this little hide and seek square for it and you can you know, keep your bishop and not have to exchange it. So actually this is a, now it's a really active bishop. So black doesn't really want to exchange it typically. Knight e5 was played, the knight went up to the center. And you know, uh, this is a pretty active knight and my mom went knight b7, just to just say, you know what, I want to exchange that knight. F4 is not a move that white wants to do at this point to defend the knight because there's, after you go F4, this square becomes extremely weak and you know, your king becomes a lot weaker. And it's just it's just not, not a move you want to do, especially because lots of times you want to push for e4 at some point in these type of positions to break the center. So f4 doesn't make a lot of sense. And knight f3 could be played, but once again, because the plan is to go e4 at some point, Monica wants to keep her knight on d2. So she opted for going knight takes d7. Once again, she doesn't want to allow black to take here because after pawn takes, this pawn would become a pretty big weakness and would give away... This square would be would be a beautiful square for the knight when the pawn was here. So she goes for knight takes d7. Queen takes d7 was played and then castles. Just getting that king to safety. And bishop e7 was played as well. And sometimes, you know, one might wonder why this black not go with the bishop to d6. But the idea of going bishop e7 instead of bishop d6 is that if the bishop is here on d6, once again with this whole e4 idea, if at any point white has the opportunity of going e4 and black cannot take that pawn for any reason, then white is going to be threatening this bishop with a tempo and then it's going to be able to go e5. So there are lots of these like uh, tactics that black just want to avoid at all costs. So bishop e7 is a bit more of a solid move. Also the bishop on d6 is blocked by a chain of pawns. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to put it there. b3 was played. Bishop wants to go to b2 and, you know, take care of that diagonal over there. Castles, getting that king to safety. Bishop b2. And now my mom said, you know what, we got to get those rooks connected, which is something that's, you know, really important. You want to get those rooks active. And when you're thinking about where to put your rooks, typically what you want to think about is what files are semi-open or open. And now if we look at this position, there are no open files. But there is a file that has the potential to open up, which is the D file. Because this pawn might take here at some point if E4 is played, and you might take this one, and etc. So that is why Rook D8 was played, because uh, there is some potential of this file getting open at some point. Uh, this also a pawn that's been pushed the most. So it makes sense to put this rook here, especially because the queen is um, the white queen is on D1 as well. So it's on the same file. So lots of different ideas. And now white is saying, you know what, I want to activate my rook as well. So rook c1 was played in this position, but what is the problem of going rook c1? Well, there's actually no problem at all. This makes a lot of sense. You're putting your rook in a semi-open file as well. But as the arrow before it was indicating, um, black gets an opportunity of counter counter-attacking, which is what my mom uh, went for. And the thing is that when you go rook c1, uh, this is a, a, a great square for the rook, but then... Uh, Black might start thinking, all right, you know what? Now you've left your spot on A1. And now if I open up the A file, then my rook is going to be active. But you're going to have to come back to the A file to, to um, exchange my rook. So in a way, it makes, um, you know, if white, if black gets this, this file open, then it kind of could, one could argue that, you know, this is a bit of a waste of a move. But I mean, right now, I mean, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to put your rook there. Like the rook on A1 is not really doing anything. But that's why at least my mom is going for a5 here because she wants to go for a5, a4 and break open the a file and start, you know, pushing on the queen side. So to avoid a4 and opening up all of this, Monica played a really good move. She won a3 and the idea is here that after a4, uh, she can go b4 and now this pawn will not be hanging anymore. So this bishop will not be able to take it. So... At this point, my mom said, you know what, we gotta, we gotta keep on pushing on the queen side. So she went b5. And here she's asking Monica a very important question. 
she's basically saying, what are you going to do with that pawn on c4? Are you going to take my b pawn? Are you going to take my d pawn? Are you going to push c5? Monica doesn't really want to keep the pawn there because after a series of exchanges, uh, the b file would get open and after something like rook b8 there, my mom would get a really, really nice open b file. So she doesn't want to go for any of that. So she's going to have to choose somewhere to go here. And she opted uh, to go for c5 and close down, you know, the queen side a bit. If she would have taken on b5 or on d5, it would have ended up just with the same position because black always needs to take with the c-pawn. Otherwise, the c-pawn, I mean, let's say that we would take with the e-pawn, the c-pawn would become a huge weakness in this position. The rook would be push, would, would be you know threatening the pawn throughout the whole game. So that would not be something that um, the black could do. This would end up being a backwards pawn. And I guess that the reason why Monica didn't do this was because, because of the fact that her rooks are not connected, there's a queen in between, it's going to be a little bit harder of, you know, like really claiming uh, the whole c file. So let's go ahead and say that, for instance, she took here and here and something like a3 was played, h3 was played just to illustrate this. After something like rook c8, if rook takes rook and rook takes rook, the rook will, would, would end up have, the black would, would, would end up controlling the c file. And if white does anything else, and I'm just going to make a move just for, to illustrate this, then uh, black would end up with a c, whoops, black, the queen would not go there. But anyways, black would end up with the c file again. So we can see that there are some issues in controlling the c file for white because of the fact that both of the pawns are not connected. Yeah, that's probably why she, she opted to go for c5. And the thing is that whenever your pawns start pushing, many times, especially in the center, the whole position changes. And this is one of those times. At this point, when, when uh, Monica goes c5, the position completely changes. Now we're going to see that my mom is going to get a new idea in this position, which is going to be to actually put some pressure on the c5 pawn. Which you may wonder, you know, what's the point of that? There is a pawn threatening that c5 pawn, but actually, uh, threatening, defending. <laughs> There's a pawn defending a pawn, but actually the idea is that what black wants to do at some point is that they want to go at some point, not now, go e5 and deviate this pawn from the protection of that pawn and then be able to take this pawn. So we're going to see some examples of that later on, but that is why queen a7 was played because my mom wanted to put some pressure over here, but she also, most importantly, wanted to give this d7 square for the knight. So now the knight has the option of going to d7 and after that at some point, you know, there might be some e5 ideas because if pawn takes, then you know, there's you can go ahead and take this one. So those are some ideas here. Queen e1 was played just because, um, you know, Monica started having probably some e4 ideas, even some f3, queen f2 ideas, trying to get the queen out this way. She doesn't really want to push this e pawn just one step because then, you know, uh, that's not really going to give her anything. She wants to break the center by going f3, e4 at some point. So she can't really go e4 right now. Pretty much always you want to try to take with the pawn here on e4. Otherwise, otherwise, let's say that, all right, now it's my mom to move, but let's say that after bishop g6, which is the move that she went for, that Monica would have gone for e4, then we can see that after something like, she would be able to go knight d5, for instance. This square would be a beautiful square for the knight. Maybe you don't have to take that first. Maybe you can take here first and just go for some, for some exchanges. But the point is, the point is that it's going to get very comfortable. You can even just take here and just go bishop f6 and just put constant pressure towards this d pawn throughout the rest of the game. There's lots of different ideas that you can go for. Um, but the main idea I think it is that you're going to be getting this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful d5 square. I don't know if you can even like take this one and then go for knight d5 here. But anyways, uh, you don't really want to push that. It's a little bit too early to go for that now. The reason why my mom went for bishop g6 was simply that she didn't want e4 to ever come with a tempo she always wanted to have the option of you know doing something else than retiring her bishop of taking here so she just went bishop g6 just kind of to save a tempo and then king h1 was played and the idea of king h1 is that at this point monica wants to go f3 and e4 she wants to take her with the pawn uh just because then you're able to grab more center but she was a bit afraid that if the king was on g1 that you know there would be lots of pressure being um being put on and that there'd be some nasty stuff happening with the queen on the same diagonal so 
She went for that and now my mom went for rook e8, just putting the rook on the same file as the queen, just to make it a little bit more uncomfortable to go for some f3, e4 ideas. But f3 was played anyways, uh, because this is what she wants to go for. And now, everybody, there were several ways that, you know, my mom could have, um, that my mom could have continued. And one of them was to go knight d7 with the idea that if e4, you can take, and after pawn takes, which is why you want f3, there is this e5 idea. And when you go e5, and this idea that I was telling you about, you, telling you about before, you break the center here, you're threatening this pawn in d4, and you kind of ask that pawn, you know, what are you gonna do? If you stay there, well, then I'll just take you, take you, and take this one. Um, if you go b4, for instance, then, you know, we're just gonna take, and this pawn is going to become extremely weak. I mean, there are ideas of this, for instance, just putting some pressure on this diagonal and just threatening with lots of pieces this pawn. This is just not a comfortable position in any single way. And if you take this one, well, then we can take this pawn, for instance. So, um, you... After something like knight d7, you don't really want to go e4. But my mom opted for going bishop f8 instead, which is simply just to have the rook on the same file here. Just being able to go knight d7, e5, a little bit more easier. And, you know, it's the same idea. It's just kind of like a bit of a waiting move. Just saying, you know what? Let's just go ahead and and, and help the rook, help the, or, or get the rook helping out on, on, um, on the push here at some point, if we do decide to push. B4 was played, very, very normal move, just to defend this pawn over here. Right now we can still with all these knight d7 ideas, e5 ideas. The idea was then to, you know, put a lot of pressure on c5, but now with b4, now there's not just, you know, this pawn defending this one, now there's also this one. So it makes a lot of sense, but b4 doesn't come without any consequences. The moment that you go b4, you're telling black that it's, you know, you're gonna let them open up at some point and get their pieces into your side. So it doesn't come without consequences, but probably a move that is necessary just to really, really keep this pawn um, together. Knight d7 was played here uh, to go for this e5 idea. Queen f2, don't wanna have the rook on the same file as the queen. And now everybody, my mom said, let's go ahead and go for another plan. Instead of counterattacking with e4, e5, let's actually go for another plan. Let's go queen c7 so that after e4, we don't counterattack in the center, but instead what we do is that we take this pawn on b4, a takes b4, and we activate our rook. And we can see that it's really important to enter the a file with the rook and not with the queen, because with the queen, it's always gonna be a bit you know, clumsy over here, like there's always gonna be ways of, of eliminating it. Not eliminating it, but like, <laughs> exposing it? No. That's not... Kicking it away, people, kicking it away. There's always gonna be ways of kicking it away. Uh, but if you have a rook, then it's going to be a lot easier to manage over here, and it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be as, as vulnerable and clumsy over there. So, bishop c3 was played. Just defending that bishop, although you do allow for this pin, but you know, this is this is really good move. And then my mom opted for just going going ahead and doubling up both of these rooks. And this, I mean, she's just saying, you know what? I just want to play on the queen side. And actually, even though this bishop does look pretty bad because of the fact that all of these pawns are on uh, dark squares, this bishop does have an important function, which is that it controls this a1 square. And why this is important is because both of these rooks are really strong in this file. This is the only open file of the position and my mom is holding it right now. So after, uh, or, or because of this bishop, white has the possibility of at some point going rook a1 and, um, you know, exchanging everything. So if that bishop was not there, then it would be a lot harder. Queen e3 was played just to get the queen out of this pin. But my mom said, you know what, let me pin you again. And she went rook eight, a three, just pinning this bishop. And now that the queen is there as well. And now everybody was the moment that, you know, Monica decided that these two rooks were just a little bit too annoying over here. So she went rook a one. And in this position, there are different ways of approaching it. You can either try to keep the pressure, which is what I, I think is, is the best. Um, and I think that is also objectively what is the best according to the engine is to go queen a7 in this position. And the idea of queen a7 is to simply keep the, keep the pressure here. Right now you're threatening the rook, 
Rook pretty much has to take this one. Otherwise, I mean, if it leaves somewhere else, then, you know, what was the point of Rook A1? So, have to take here. Rook takes. And now it's going to be kind of tough for White to see what they're going to do. They cannot enter uh, this file in any single way. So, they're going to have to start playing, you know, either in the center or either on the queen side. Uh, sorry, on the king side. But then this queen is going to be able to enter on A3. And it's going to get a bit nasty for for White. Um... So this is definitely a really good idea. I mean, something like queen a3 and rook c2, that's a very big threat in this position. So that would have been quite a good idea of keeping the pressure going, but my mom opted for instead taking on a1. And the difference that we can see is that after rook takes a1 and now queen a7, now Monica gets to exchange those rooks. And I would argue that, um, you know, having this position with the rooks instead of having this position is better for black when one when there's one more rook because that extra rook is going to be attacking a lot on the queen side and because the other rook cannot really defend in any in any good way um it's gonna be a bit of a clumsy rook versus a very active rook but anyways she opted for this and e5 was played by monica a really nice move just to limit the you know the movement of the knight and even though by, by stopping knight f6 but even though it is limiting the movement of the knight. It doesn't mean that the knight doesn't have any moves at all. So knight b8 was actually a really nice maneuver. The idea of going knight a6 and putting pressure on this b4 pawn. And right now there is actually just... There, there aren't that many ways of defending this pawn. Um, and one of the few ways that there is going knight f1, you know, moving the knight away. This bishop over here is very, very, very sneaky. I mean, I know that some of you may have thought that knight b1 was possible. Don't lie to me. I know that you thought about it. You know why? Because I thought about it when I was looking at this game like two. But it is not because this bishop on g6, it's extremely, is extre extremely sneaky looking all the way from here. So this is actually a really, really, uh, really cool, really cool uh, maneuver. So knight f1 is played just so that after knight a6 the queen can go to this diagonal and defend this pawn that way so queen e1 was played and now my mom just said you know what let's get our bishop out our bishop on f8 is doing nothing let's get it out to maybe go to g5 or something knight went to e3 just uh i mean here he can't go obviously because of this bishop but just to get the knight a little bit more active on f1 it's not doing too much and now my mom went for bishop g5 threatening this knight the threat right now is to go bishop takes knight and after queen takes knight there is knight takes b4 so threatening this knight and just you know kind of forcing white to go f4 because if the knight goes back to f1 then you know it was a bit pointless to to go knight a3 so she's just trying just trying to irritate a little bit the position right um it's like a like a flu like you know always buzzing around everywhere um <laughs> which is what you want to do in chess you want to be a flu <laughs> <laughs> at least if you find flutes annoying then you want to be a flu um and so f4 was played here but the thing is that the moment you play f4 then what my mom was arguing was that you know this is gonna weaken some squares uh this e4 square for instance is not protected anymore so after i go bishop e7 i'm gonna have more movement with this bishop and you may think that actually a bishop e4 is not that that good of a move but i'm gonna explain why it actually um you know it's a good move and why actually the the engine really 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 liked it so um yeah let me go ahead and do that very quickly so h3 was played and the idea was to go g4 and at this point bishop d3 was played but actually the engine at this point really liked bishop e4 and the idea of going bishop e4 uh is that even though it looks like after bishop takes and pawn takes that you know there is a very weak pawn here because the queen can take it there is this maneuver of knight c7 knight d5 and this knight on d5 is a monster like even if black loses this e4 bit this e4 pawn which is gonna be tough to lose because the queen is constantly pointing towards this bishop and the knight is constantly pointing towards this a knight on d5 is worth so much such a great knight stopping this pawn from any pushing i mean yes black is a pawn down but like is this pawn ever gonna push now so you know it's actually just good for it for black that this pawn exists because that means that this bishop can't go here so a knight over here would be an extremely strong piece and this is actually um the line that the engine said 
would maybe give a slight advantage for black and this is probably if you're going for a win what you, you what you should what you would want to try to try to do because you know even if the engine just says that it's a bit better for black practically that can be a whole other thing because it's very very comfortable to play this with black very clear plan but bishop d3 was played instead not bishop e4 queen went to d2 just attack that bishop bishop went to b1 uh just kind of you know staying on that diagonal king h2 getting a king move in bishop d8 and now they both started to just go a bit back and forth and this ended up being a draw because they repeated the same position three times and my mom was very happy with a draw in this game because once again she was uh initially like she wanted to get a draw because she was playing with the black pieces and she prefers playing with the white pieces so her idea was to you know make a draw with the black pieces and then try to win with the white pieces um and the reason why they made a draw was because this is a very drawish position is if nobody overextends like the pawn structure is very 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 i mean it's it's pretty much identical if you just look at these pawns like they're all blocking each other there's no pawn that can become a, a pass pawn and there's not really any good way of attacking yes monica might have been able to try something like g4 f5 but that could become extremely dangerous and you know it's not really something you want to do in this type of tournament you lose one game in this tournament and it's very hard to come back because that puts you in a position where you need to win the next game to um to to stay in the tournament so um nobody really wanted to overextend i really don't think this would have been that great of a plan anyway so maybe my mom could have tried to go this bishop e4 idea but i think that she thought it was a bit risky in case she lost that pawn and she was quite happy with the draw here so that is how the game ended very very nice game uh, by both of them monica Sako is ex an extremely you know strong grandmaster from poland um and yeah my mom played a really nice game as well 37 moves that ended up being so yeah this was the game i hope that you enjoyed you know watching me go through this game and i hope that you feel like you learned a lot or that you know just just that you enjoyed seeing how it's going for my mom in this tournament I will be doing a second video uh, where I talk about how the second game of this match went. So, you know, I'll put that in the description box whenever that is ready. Please tell me in the comments down below if you like seeing me doing, you know, YouTube stuff, like YouTube exclusive stuff and not just, you know, putting in my streams. Because I thought it was super fun to, um, to, to film something for YouTube and just like film something. And if you have watched it all the way here, Tell me in the comments down below because guys, I'm gonna tell you a secret. Come here, come here closer. I'm gonna tell you a secret. This is the second time I record the video because I forgot to record my audio in the last time. <laughs> Anyways, people, only people that stayed here and watched the whole thing know this, all right? <laughs> only you, only you know it. All right, well, I, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Please, please, please subscribe. If you did, I'm trying to reach 50,000 subscribers. We're really close, so I would appreciate that a lot, especially if you want to see more videos like this. I'm going to be filming lots of, you know, YouTube, YouTube stuff, so I'm super excited about that. And I will see you in the next video, everybody. Stay happy, stay healthy, and have a wonderful morning, evening, day, whatever it is, wherever you live. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye!